Hey, good morning, guys. My name is Matt Davis, and I am one of the student pastors here at our Bayou City Cypress campus. And so I'm excited to uh, be here with you this morning, and I'm glad you all came, um, especially facing the double whammy of the first spring break, I mean, the first Sunday of spring break and daylight savings. Um, I wonder how many people um, are going to come in in an hour expecting, like, that's when church starts. I've done it many times, so no judgment. But um, I've actually done it one time when I was, uh, had a part in a service, um, and I totally was like, what do you, oh, so yeah, so you made it, and that's a good thing. Um, Pastor Johnny and his family are out of town, so I'm kind of filling in for him today, and so we have a lot to cover. Um, we are in Nehemiah, but uh, before we dive in, I just want to take a moment and really, um, once again, pray and ask that God would prepare our hearts um, to hear a message from him and that the Holy Spirit would move in our lives, in our thoughts, and in this place. So if you would, please pray with me. Father God, you are good, and you are faithful, and you are loving, and you are strong. And Lord, we come before you and ask that your spirit, like we sang, that your spirit would fall on us, on your sons and your daughters, and you would fill us to the measure with your presence. Lord, there's, um, there's so much in our lives that we easily get distracted by, and we ask that you would silence all of those things. Whatever baggage and burdens we bring into this room, would we lay at your feet right now? Would you open our eyes to the wonders of your word, and would we come to know you more and experience your salvation, your healing, and your deliverance in our minds, in our hearts, our souls, our bodies, God? We are yours. We are your people. Be glorified and be pleased and be delighted in what we are doing in this room this morning. Thank you. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, so as we begin, I, if this is your first time here, or maybe you've missed a couple weeks, I want to take a moment and fill you in on where we are and what we're doing. This spring, as a church, we have decided to go through the book of Nehemiah. It's an Old Testament book, and we're today going to be looking at chapter 10. So if you would, go ahead and open your Bibles. And as you do, I'm going to kind of set up Nehemiah and Nehemiah 10 in a bigger perspective. So in, AD, no, in BC 597, the city of Jerusalem was laid siege by King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians. And they had the biggest and strongest empire an army that had ever existed. And for 18 months, they surrounded the city of Jerusalem. No one came in and no one came out. And at the end of the siege, uh, the Babylonians came into the city and plundered the city. They burnt the city and they slaughtered its people. And those who survived the slaughter and the attack were um, taken slaves and uh, marched into exile in Babylon over 800 miles away. And there they lived. 77 years later, in uh, 520 BC, a small group of Jews were allowed to return to Jerusalem and to Israel to resettle. And there they lived for another 70 years. And they were small and um, they, they, just, they barely made do. And then another 70 years after that, Nehemiah, the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes, requested and was given permission to return to Jerusalem with the explicit purpose of rebuilding the walls to surround the city, which for the previous 153 years had laid in ruin. And so after getting permission from the king and after praying about it and, and being granted God's favor and preparing, Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem with workers and materials and supplies in hand. But when he returns, he finds things are in worse disarray than he expected. The resettlers who had lived there are poorly organized and poorly defended, and they've been exploited by the regional and foreign warlords in the area who have been just oppressing them. And they are opposed to the rebuilding of the wall, because to rebuild the wall will protect the city and will protect the Israelites from the warlords. And so they are determined to stop it. So Nehemiah gathers the people together, and he urges them, and he convinces them to work anyway. And in um, Nehemiah 4, and th 3 and 4, it tells us how they worked 
with a hammer in one hand, their, like, their tools in one hand, and the sword at their side, ready to defend themselves and fight back if needed. And in a remarkable 52 days, they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. 52 days. If anyone's ever had a remodel in their house, like, we'll know 52 days is crazy. This was the walls surrounding the city. And so after they rebuild the walls in 52 days, the people of Israel all come together and to celebrate and to commemorate this moment because it's a massive moment in um, the history of Israel because it is a do-over. It is a re-establishment of them as the people of God in their ancestral and uh, spiritual homeland. And so they come together, and what they do to celebrate and to commemorate this moment is they begin to read from the law of Moses, the Torah. And they begin to uh, read everything that they, like that it was written in it. And they begin to confess all the places where they failed. And then they begin to um, repent of their sin. And what they're doing is trying to reestablish themselves as the people of God. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to read um, Nehemiah 10, but we're actually going to pick up one verse pre, uh, prior in Nehemiah 9, verse 38. Because of all of this, this is Nehemiah writing. It's, this is, Nehemiah is written almost in the form of a journal. But he says, because of all of this, we made a firm covenant in writing on the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. And on the seals are the names of Nehemiah, the governor, the son of Hakaliah, Zedekiah, Sariah, Azariah, Jeremiah, Pasher, Amariah, Malchijah, Hattush, Shebaniah, Malak, Hiram, Merimoth, Obadiah, Daniel, Ginnathon, Barak, Meshulam, Abijah, and Mijamin, Mazariah, Bigai, Shemaiah, these are the priests, and the Levites, Jeshua, the son of Azaniah, Binuai, the son of Henadad, Cadmiel, and their brothers, Shebaniah, Hodiah, uh, Ketiah, Peliah, Hanan, Micah, Rehob, Hashabiah, Zachar, Sherebiah, Sher- Sher- Shebaniah, Hodiah, Benai, Beninu, and the chief priests of the people, Perosh, Pathath Moab, Elam, Zatu, Benai, Bunai, Asgad, Bibai, Adonijah, Bigvi, Aden, Ater, Hezekiah, Azur, Hodiah, Hashem, Bezai, Hereth, Anaoth, Nebai, Migpiash, Meshulam, Hezer, Meshibazel, Zadok, Jadua, Pel- Pelatiah, Hanan, Ananiah, Hoshea, Hananiah, Hashabub, Halohesh, Pilha, Shobek, Rahum, Hashabana, Masaya, Ahiah, Hanan, Anan, Malak, Haram, and Benaniah. That's a lot of names. Thank you. Let me just say, um, I really considered skipping over this whole section. But I didn't want to do it for two reasons. One is this is a list of who's who in Israel. This is, imagine if we had all of our political leaders on both sides, in both parties, come together, as well as our celebrities and influencers and business executives. If all the people of America came together and uh, signed a document that said, we agree and we will follow God's word. As remarkable as that may seem, that's what's happening. And the other reason I decided to read this passage with all these names, as tough to pronounce as they are, and guys, you don't even want to know how many hours this week I spent practicing. Um, I wish it was natural. It was not. But um, the reason I did that is because these are real flesh and blood people. They were individuals who had dreams and fears and families and hopes, just like us. And, and for most of us, history might not remember us 
153 years from now. Even more, history might not remember us 2,465 years from now. That's how far we are from when this was written. But their lives were significant. They were important, and they mattered. And for us, I want to take a moment and honor these men and the families and groups that they represented because their sacrifices, their effort was worth it. Also, if my name was written in the Bible, I wouldn't want people just to skip over it. I would want someone to say it, even if it was hard to pronounce. And so that's why I wanted to include it. But I want to go on. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, and the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the people of the lands of the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, and all who have knowledge and understanding, join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and his rules and his statutes. We will not give our daughters to the people of the land or take their daughters for our sons. And if the people of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. And we will forgo the crops of the seventh year and the extraction of every debt. We also take on ourselves the obligation to give, a yearly, to give yearly a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbaths and the new moons, the appointed feast, the holy things, and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for all the works of our, our God. We, the priests, the Levites, and the people have likewise cast lots for the wood offering to bring it into the house of our God according to our father's houses, at times appointed, year by year, to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as it is written in the law. We obligate ourselves to bring the first fruit of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of every tree, year by year, to the house of the Lord. Also to bring to the house of our God, to the priests who minister in the house of our God, the firstborn of our sons and our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and of our flocks, and to bring the first of our dough and our contributions, the first of every tree, the wine, the oil, to the priest, to the chambers of the house of our God, and to bring the Levites the tithes from our ground. For it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all our towns where we labor. And the priest and the sons of Aaron shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes, and the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes to the house of God, to the chambers of the storehouse, for the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contributions of grain and wine and oil to the chambers where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers. We will not neglect the house of our God. So we see all this practical stuff. We see what they're doing. And I want to take a moment right now and quickly look at um, two, a word that appears twice. First in verse 32 and in verse 35. The word is obligation and obligate. They obligated themselves to the house of God and to the people of God. And obligation means to commit, to bind. Israel was choosing it to bind itself to the Lord by intentionally and sacrificially investing themselves in his house and his people. As believers, we also have an obligation. And I don't know about you, but that word obligation kind of makes me bristle a little bit. I'm not sure I like it. It feels onus. It feels heavy. It feels burdensome, especially when it makes demands on my time and my money. I don't know if I like it. And when we look at it, um, there's all sorts of reasons we can be wary. Personally, I'm oftentimes wary of institutions. But notice as this passage never once mentions that the Levites, the priest, and even the house of God 
deserve such special um, investments and sacrificial investments? I think it's because they don't. They don't deserve it. Bayou City doesn't deserve it. But God does. Our giving of our time and resources is a way of acknowledging God's goodness and his provision and his faithfulness to us. When we give, when we sacrificially invest, we are giving back to God what is already his. And so often what we do is we fall into the illusion that what is mine is mine and that we live in a scarcity, in an, uh, in an economy of scarcity where there's not enough to go around. But our God is a God of abundance. Amen. He is sovereign over all things. And so as we look at this, I'm not, I'm not really even talking about your, your tithe, your money, but I want to ask you, have you decided to truly and fully invest yourself in this body or in a local body if you're visiting? But are you invested if you're a believer in the church? I know it's a, kind of awkward to say, but have you invested your life, your resources, your talents into the body? Because despite our, our current cultural climate, no man is an island. We were made to be dependent on God, but also interdependent with each other. We need each other. And so this obligation is a way of us coming together and living our faith out in real and substantial ways. On our own, we're never going to make it. Because we, or at least I can speak for myself, I am fantastic at coming up with excuses for my poor choices and bad behavior. I can lie to myself better than anyone else in the world can lie to me. And so we need people around us to challenge us, to invest in us. But to do that, we also need to make that investment. We need to pour ourselves out into each other. This year, this week, marks the anniversary of when COVID really started turning everything upside down in our country. It's been a year. And guys, it's been a crazy year. And it's been a crazy year for our church. We have struggled in ways that we, that a year and a week ago, didn't ever imagine we would. We've had some turnover. We've had some uh, issues come up. We've had some things that we thought we were on the cusp of be delayed and put off. And so what I want to ask, though, like, is how can we come together right now in a similar way to where Jerusalem, like the Israelites were rebuilding Jerusalem, how can we come together and rebuild after a year of crazy? And maybe that means together individually we need to come together and rebuild our lives. What does community look like? What does accountability look like? What does walking in faith and in victory look like? And maybe it's practically some things that we need to do here. For example, right now, the student and kid ministries of our church, of our campus, are still struggling to find volunteers. So I want to ask, would you be willing to invest yourself in the lives of the next generation, to obligate yourselves to their hearts and their nurture? I also want to ask you, would you obligate yourself to pray faithfully and fervently for the staff and elders of our church. There are big decisions that are having to be made, some of them quickly, or some of them it feels like in a, in a fog because we don't know what's coming up. I know in the student ministry, it's been hard to plan because we feel like we haven't been able to really even see much more than a month out. You get things going and then stuff changes. So would you pray for us Pray that those of us in leadership, that your community group leaders, would have wisdom and discernment to be faithful stewards of God, that we would come to this house and provide a place, a safe place to worship and to encounter God and to meet with the Holy Spirit. Can we commit to praying, not just as an afterthought, but as something of most importance?
It's different to invest yourself than to be a casual observer. But I think when we invest ourselves sacrificially, it's there that we will find that we won't neglect the house of God. Now I want to turn back, though, to the central section where, um, where Nehemiah is talking, and he says they've separated themselves, and everyone comes together, the sons, the daughters, the children, the, the men, the women, the servants, everyone who is a part of the community comes together, and look at verse 29. They join with their brothers, their nobles, to enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. What is going on here? A curse and an oath? What is he talking about? Well, I think to understand this, we have to look back up at verse um, 38 of chapter 9 to a single word. Because of all of this, we made a firm covenant in writing. Covenant. What we're going to find is that word changes everything for them it also changes everything for us. So what we're going to do is we're going to now go and do a brief search and, and, under, and to come to understand what this word actually is. So if you would, please turn with me to Genesis 12. If you don't want to turn in your Bibles because we will be flipping around, it's going to be on the screen as well. And so I'm going to read the first couple of verses to you. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred, and your father's house, to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all families of the earth will be blessed. So this dude, Abram, is someone we will come to know, his name is changed later, as Abraham. And all we know about this guy at this point is simply that God spoke to him. We know nothing about his character. We know nothing about his background, his history. Um, we know a little bit about his family and kind of where he lived. But we don't know, like in scripture elsewhere, we know things like Noah was a righteous man. Enoch walked with God. We don't get any of that. We just know that Abraham is just a solitary dude that God shows up and speaks to and says, Abraham. I will make your name great. I will make you the father of many nations, and I will give you land, and I will, um, and I will bless the world through you. So leave and go. So Abraham does. He goes. And so he starts following God wherever that may take him. Now I want you to flip a couple pages over to Genesis 15. What we find here is eight or nine years have passed since God's initial promise to Abraham. And so it says, after these things, well, and as during this nine years, we find that Abraham's character, not too great. He's kind of a liar. He doesn't have the best marriage. He makes some pretty foolish mistakes in his relationship with his wife. But what we find is, it says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield your very great reward. But Abraham said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue to be childless, and the heir of my household is Eleazar of Damascus. And God said to him, no, and Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. So what's happening is God shows up and starts speaking to him, and Abraham's like, Dude, God, you gave me this promise. But was it all talk? Because you said I'd be the father of a great nation. And yet, at this point, scholars think he's around 84. He has no kid. His wife is in her late 70s. Childbirth typically doesn't happen then. And so he's like, God, what do I do? A distant relative is going to be the heir. So is this, what am I doing with my life? Is this real? Is this legitimate? And God responds. He says, this man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought Abraham outside and said, look to the heavens and number the stars if you were able to number them. And then he said, so shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. 
And then the Lord said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But Abraham said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, and a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these and cut them in half and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. As the sun started going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and they will be servants there and will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. I'm going to skip down to verse 17. And when the sun had gone down, it was dark, and behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates. So what we see here is uh, God affirms that promise. God says, here's the promise I'm making to you. I will give you land. I will give you offspring who will become a great nation, and I will bless the whole world through you. But then God has him do something weird. He takes a bunch of animals, slaughters them, cuts them in half, and then lays them out. Kind of disturbing and, and gross and messy. And then Abraham passes out. Now, that makes sense because those are some big animals. I don't know about you, but like killing and chopping up a heifer doesn't exactly sound quick and easy. And so Abraham passes, through, passes out, and then something unique happens. A torch, a flame appears and passes through the pieces. And it says the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. What is all that about? What is all of that about? The word made a covenant in Hebrew is translated kerat barith, and it literally means to cut a solemn oath or vow. And so what's happening here is that God is doing something in the bodies of those animals. And I read a commentary that said, it was custom in making solemn covenants to pass between the divided parts of the victims. The ritual of cutting an animal in two and walking between the severed pieces communicated that a person was pledging their very life to fulfill their promise. If I, kept, if I fail to keep my word, you get to do this to me. So back then, there were no lawyers, there were no notarized documents, there was no like, established legal system. So when two people would make an agreement, they would get a bunch of animals, kill them, chop them up in half, and then they would say, if I break my word, I will literally, you can do this to me. You can kill me and cut me in half. It was kind of disturbing, but it was solemn. But interestingly, when we look here, this covenant is a one-sided covenant. Abraham doesn't walk through the pieces. Only God in the form of fire passes through. God was promising to Abraham, you don't have to do anything. The, the weight of this promise is on me. I will fulfill it. All Abraham had to do was accept God's word. Now I want us to flash flash forward to Exodus 24. Now, did you catch that part about how God said your, your descendants are going to be enslaved for 400 years? True to his word, that's exactly what happened. Abraham started, had, some, had a son who then had sons who then had a bajillion sons. They grew and ultimately they ended up in Egypt. And there they were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. Then God, just like he had told Abraham, pulls them out. That's the story of Moses. That's the story of the Exodus. That's the story of the plagues and the burning bush and parting the Red Sea. And so as he's walking, like leading to them to their new home, to the promised land, which is called the promised land because of the promise he made to Abraham, they stop at Mount Sinai. And there on Mount Sinai, Moses goes up and meets with God and God gives him the law 
the Ten Commandments to teach uh, the people and to teach Moses how to live in a right relationship with each other and with God. And so Moses comes down, and here's what happens. We're going to pick up in verse 3 of Exodus 24. Moses came and told all the people the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered in one voice and said, All the words of the Lord that he has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, 12 pillars according to 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people who offered burnt offerings and sacrifice uh, peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and he put it in basins. In half of the blood, he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant, the book of the covenant, and he read it out loud in the hearing of all the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and he threw it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Now we have another weird passage. So Moses comes down with the law and they're like, we'll do it. We'll do it. Sign us up. We're in, we're in, we're in. And so again with covenant, got like they take the animals, they slaughter them and they have the blood and they throws it on the altar. And we get that. It's like, okay, so for some reason, like the sacrificing animals and blood is part of that process. We've heard that before. But can you imagine, can you imagine the horror and disgust of the people in the front row when, when Moses reads and says, hey, will you do it? And they're like, yeah, we'll do it. We'll do all of it. We will obey. And he picks up the buckets of blood and just douses them with it. Disgusting. <laughs> Disgusting and horrifying. Why would he do such a thing? What is up with blood? Why the animals in Genesis 15? Why the blood here? What is up with blood? Leviticus um, 17, 14 tells us why. Leviticus 17, 14 tells us, for the life of every creature is in its blood. Its blood is its life. We know this. To give blood is to give life. To lose blood is to lose life. And so a covenant is a solemn vow. It is a promise sealed in blood. And in this moment, at this moment, this wasn't just God making the covenant. It was a two-way covenant. And the people of Israel said, we are binding ourselves. We are promising in blood as a matter of life and death that we will follow your law. We will obey you. We will do what you say. We will live right before you and right before others. And yet, within a matter of weeks, things fall apart. I want us to skip now to Deuteronomy 31, 30, Deuteronomy 30. Now, here's what's happening. We're fast forwarding 40 years. So we started with Abraham, then Moses. Now we're still with Moses, but we're 40 years later after this covenant has been made. And what happened was God took the people to the edge of the promised land and they refused to go in. They refused to obey him. They said, nope, we're out. So God said, if that's what you want, okay, I will let you wander around in the desert for 40 years. And they do and an entire generation passes away. And now here they are, they're on the cusp of the promised land once again, and they get a do-over. And this time they're like, we're going. But Moses knows he's not going to go in. He's not going. And so what he does is the last thing in his farewell address is he says, we're going to reread this covenant that you signed. You've got to know this. And so he reads it out loud to them all, the whole law and the Torah. And then he ends it with, we're going to start in verse 15. He says, I see I have set before you today life and goodness, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God and walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you will surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan River to enter and possess. 
I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the, your, that the Lord swore to give to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So what he's saying is, look, you made the covenant. It's here. You are bound by it. Are you going to live into it? If you do, you get life, blessings, and goodness. Or you get death, evil, and curses. And God's saying this because he is life. He, in choosing him, you get life, you get goodness, you get love. Turning your back on him, you can't have those other things. But he's saying, will you do it? Will you do it? And the people of God, the people of Israel say, yes, we will. Yes, we will. But then the rest of the Israel's history is them cycling in and out of disobedience and rebellious, rebellion and um, like just awful idolatry against God. And so sure enough, just like Moses said here, it cost them their existence in the promised land. That is why God allowed Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians to come in and destroy the people, destroy the city, to destroy the temple. Their very identity was shaken because it was rooted in this covenant. So then when we flash, flash, flash forward to Nehemiah 10, what they, where they are, this momentous moment, is a do-over. The people of God are standing there, and they're repeating the covenant, and they're saying, yes, 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 and then they sign it. All their representatives, all their leaders sign the covenant, and in doing so, they sign their death warrant because they cannot keep it. They are powerless to keep it. They are promising, just like their forefathers did, to something that they cannot live up to. And so their lives are forfeit, just like those animals. They're going to try, but their good intentions just aren't good enough. Now, why does any of this matter for us? Because their story is our story. Their lives are our lives. They were flesh and blood people prone to foolish decisions and bad choices just like we are. How many of us have come up with resolutions, with diet plans and exercise goals um, every January? Or with, with this time we're going to be different in our relationship. Or when I get mad, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond differently. Or I'm not going to gossip. I'm not going to look at this on the internet. I'm not going to do this or that or whatever. And like we know and we want to. And we know it's better for us. And yet we fail. Our best, our efforts are not good enough. Our addictions and our failures and our faults they seem too big, and they are too big. Their story is our story. The Apostle Paul writes about this in Romans 7, and I want to read to you this passage out of the message translation of the Bible. Paul writes, but I need something more. I know the law, but I can't keep it. And if the power of sin within me keeps, it's like the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging all my best intentions. I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide to not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in action. Something has gone wrong deep within me, and it gets the better of me every time. Something has gone wrong deep within me. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. 
I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything, and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? Isn't that our question in life? I remember there was a time in my early 20s when that was my question. God, is there anything you can do for me? Something has gone terribly wrong deep within me, and I can't get away from it. God, I, I hate me. What do I do? The covenant that was supposed to give us life and be the embodiment of God's promises and show us how to live in right relationship with God and everyone else actually just became the albatross, the chains on my neck that were drowning me because I can't do it. And so what do we do? Do we give up? Do we toss in the towel? Do we walk away? Not because we don't want to, but because we just can't. We can't. That's when we remember that we are people of the new covenant. Would you turn with me to Mark 14? And when the disciples were eating, Jesus took bread, this is verse 22, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, this is my body. And then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said, This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Remember that a covenant is a promise sealed in blood. That a covenant said, if I don't fulfill my end, you get to do that to me. In Jesus, we have a new covenant. A covenant that was made, signed, and sealed in his body and by his blood. And so when we talk about being washed in the blood or covered by the blood... That reminds us of that picture of Moses chunking the blood on us. But it's not oxen blood. It's not cow blood. It's God's own son. He took the price of our failures. He took on the weight of our sin, of our addiction, of our shame on himself. He died for it because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. The gift of God in Jesus is eternal life. We don't have to be weighed down by our sin anymore. We have an opportunity to make an exchange, and that is the gospel. We have been saved by grace, God's grace in Jesus. And we experience it just like Abraham through faith. And so I want to ask you, where is your faith? this morning. Where is your faith? Are you experiencing God's grace? If we're honest, all of us have places in our lives, in our hearts and souls, where God's grace should be, but it isn't. Are we willing to come to him and enter into that new covenant? Or are we going to work ourselves to death trying to earn it? And some of us are just, are, won't come near because we're afraid. Because we're like, oh, if, if he knew what I've done, the things I've said, or, or even what was done to me, he wouldn't want anything to do with me. And that's not the story of God's grace. That's not the gospel. Jesus isn't judgy in that way. And he's not afraid of our mess. He enters into it. And he heals us. He redeems us. That is the promise of scripture. And he does so because he loves us. 
And so as we close, there's going to be some uh, men and women of our church come, who stand up here and are doing our last song. And, and I want to invite you for prayer. But if you don't know this God, this Jesus, if you've never entered into this new covenant, please lay down your burdens, lay down the weight of sin and enter into him. Experience salvation. That's a weird word we often say, but it's saving ourselves from ourselves and from the mess of life. Or maybe we have experienced salvation, but we've just been living in this constant cycle of shame and guilt and defeat. Come to your brothers and sisters where you are loved, and together we will pray, and we will like receive and trust by faith in what God has done, and we will find redemption. Now, it may not be easy, but it will always be good, and he is faithful. So please pray with me. Father, we thank you that you are a redeeming God, that you are a good God. We, thankful, we are thankful that in your blood is the new covenant that saves us. And so, God, we ask that first you would see our areas of unbelief. God, help our unbelief and give us faith. Holy Spirit, stir up in us a desire and a courage to know you and want to know you and to pursue you and do whatever it takes to let go of the life sentence that we, we cling to because we don't know any better. Thank you that you are a redeeming and loving God and that we are fully loved and that your grace is extended to us even this morning. It's in your name we pray, amen.